Welcome back to Bad Things in History, where we save all our begging until the very end of the video and skip straight to the depressing stuff. For example, the treatment of military veterans has been controversial at every point in history. Those who sacrifice their time and health to fight in wars often discover that they are discarded and neglected once the crisis has passed. In the United States, this problem has nearly caused armed revolt several times. Today we are going to tell you about World War I veterans who demanded what they were owed. In return, they were attacked by the United States military. The First Mutiny Many modern military traditions have their roots in antiquity. For hundreds of years, those who served in the Roman legions were conscripted. Only landowners were eligible to serve during times of war. They were also unpaid. Those drafted into the ranks were even required to buy their own equipment. The government offered nothing in return for this service. That changed in 107 BC. Recruits for the Roman military were finally paid to fight Rome's enemies. The equipment they needed would be provided by the state. And when the term of service ended, provided the soldier survived, he would be paid with land. The idea of paying soldiers who were willing to join was revolutionary. It created a more professional and effective military. The countries of Europe retained this knowledge long after the Roman Empire was gone. When the Revolutionary War erupted, the fledgling United States had to learn the lessons of the past all over again. The problem of compensating disabled soldiers appeared very early in the conflict and Congress tried to address it. In 1776, they passed a law ensuring that disabled soldiers would be paid a cash bonus for their suffering. It wasn't very helpful because most disabled veterans couldn't work. Some of those who were fighting in the war began running away instead of risking injury or death. After all, the government wouldn't help them or their families if the worst should come to pass. To stop mass desertions during the war, Congress finally created a pension plan for disabled soldiers. The military seemed to be appeased and continued fighting. Eventually the conflict reached an end, but Congress never actually paid the soldiers what they were owed. This resulted in the Pennsylvania Mutiny of 1783. The first capital of the federal government was in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. On June 17, 1783, Congress received a message from veterans stationed nearby. They demanded payment for their service in the Revolutionary War, and if they were not paid, there would be consequences. Congress ignored the demands. On June 20th, 400 former soldiers took control of the building where Congress met. They sealed the doors and prevented many members of the legislature from leaving. Alexander Hamilton was eventually able to convince a soldier to let a small group depart. He then sent word to the Pennsylvania state government asking them to protect the federal government from this mutiny. The state did nothing to help. Eventually, George Washington ordered troops into the city. They arrested the mutinous former soldiers and ended the violence. This event is also one of the reasons why Washington, D.C. was created. The federal government wanted a district completely under its control. Congress passed a law in 1788 which finally ensured soldiers were paid a proper bonus. The bonuses were paid as a combination of land and cash just as the Roman Empire had once done. Originally, a soldier could be eligible for up to 100 acres of land, but in the 1850s this was increased to 160 acres of land. The problem with this compensation scheme is that the United States did not have infinite land. By the mid-1800s, some states, such as Tennessee, had more than 40% of its farmable land in the hands of veterans. In 1860, the military bonus program was finally changed to cash only. Veterans were no longer entitled to receive land for their service. By the 1890s, they were no longer entitled to a bonus at all. As far as the United States government was concerned, serving in the military was its own reward. By the end of World War I, many veterans would disagree. Fair Compensation 
Although World War I veterans were not entitled to a bonus, the United States government decided to give them one anyway. Those who served in the conflict were given $60 for their service. That would be worth about $947 today. The veterans were not happy with this gift from the government. The First World War was a conflict unlike any other. A significant number of former soldiers suffered debilitating physical injuries. Many who appeared otherwise fine had severe cases of post-traumatic stress disorder. It was difficult for many veterans to find work and for those who did, keeping a job could be impossible. In 1919, United States veterans created a non-profit organization known as the American Legion. Its goal was to help improve the lives of veterans. One of the Legion's first battles was convincing the government to give a bonus to the soldiers who sacrificed for their country. Congress was sympathetic to the cause. They voted to enact the World War Adjusted Compensation Act in 1924 that would finally offer some relief to veterans. Calvin Coolidge was president at the time. He vetoed the bill, stating that patriotism bought and paid for is not patriotism. Congress overrode his veto and the bill went into effect. But the joy felt by former soldiers at this victory was short-lived. For many of them, the bonus wouldn't be available for several years. The amount paid was based on days of service. If a veteran was entitled to $50 or less, it would be paid immediately. Otherwise, the amount owed was placed into a trust where it would gain interest. The veterans were given certificates that could not be redeemed for 20 years. It seemed as though the battle was over and the veterans had lost, but their patience would wear thin yet again in a few short years. Bonus Expeditionary Force As the 1930s began, so did the Great Depression. The economy was in shambles and jobs were difficult to find. For those who served in the last war, it was almost impossible to make a living. They no longer had the option to wait for their bonuses to be paid. In the spring and summer of 1932, thousands of veterans decided that there was strength in numbers. Between 17,000 and 25,000 veterans organized themselves and began marching to Washington, D.C. Although these soldiers had fought in the war within racially segregated units, now they had a common cause. Veterans of all races and their families walked into the nation's capital, and they didn't intend to leave empty-handed. They called themselves the Bonus Expeditionary Force. The media referred to them as the Bonus Army. Most of these former soldiers were also completely destitute. They set up camp from across a nearby river and began making shelters that were known as Hoovervilles. They used whatever construction materials were available in local dumps. A shanty town built with tin and cardboard soon appeared. The veterans and their families may have lived in complete poverty, but they were disciplined and organized. The makeshift community had clear roads and very little crime. The superintendent of Washington, D.C. police, Pelham D. Glassford, worked very closely with the veterans to maintain order. Herbert Hoover was president and was running for re-election. He hoped that the protesters would eventually disperse on their own and that he would not have to intervene, but events soon moved in an unfortunate direction. A bill was proposed in Congress that would pay the World War I veterans sooner rather than making them wait for several more years. It didn't receive enough votes to pass and the protesters became increasingly angry. After the bill failed, the veterans did not return home. They stayed in their makeshift shelters and continued advocating for some type of economic relief. On July 28th, Glassford was ordered to clear the Hooverville structures and remove the protesters from the city. The veterans left, then later returned to their camps. Police drew their revolvers and began shooting. Two men were killed by the gunfire. The commission in charge of Washington, D.C. felt they could no longer control the situation. They asked for help. President Hoover sent the army to finish what the police had started. MacArthur Attacks The officers in charge of pushing the veterans out of Washington, D.C. would become famous during World War II, but their first appearance in the public spotlight was 
not flattering. Douglas MacArthur was the Army's chief of staff in 1932. He had been expecting the order to attack for some time. In preparation, he tried to change public opinion by talking to the press at every opportunity. He accused the protesting veterans of being communist sympathizers who wanted to overthrow the government. At one point, he stated, Pacifism and its bedfellow communism are all around us. George S. Patton would one day be a famous general. In 1932, he was a major and was under MacArthur's command. Patton also had advice for his troops. Here is what he told them to do when facing the Bonus Expeditionary Force. If you must fire, do a good job. A few casualties become martyrs. A large number, an object lesson. When a mob starts to move, keep it on the run. Use a bayonet to encourage its retreat. If they are running, a few good wounds in the buttocks will encourage them. If they resist, they must be killed. MacArthur and his troops massed on the other side of the river. A bridge separated them from the makeshift town the veterans created. Walter W. Waters was the leader of the Bonus Army, and he knew that if the veterans didn't leave, it would end in violence. They did not want that because many of them had their wives and children with them. Walter asked MacArthur if the veterans would be given the chance to gather their belongings and retreat from Washington, D.C. in an orderly manner. MacArthur replied, Yes, my friend, of course. Walter Waters would soon discover that MacArthur was a liar. President Hoover twice sent orders to MacArthur telling him to not cross the river, but he ignored the president and his promise to Walter Waters. At 4.45 p.m., MacArthur ordered the military to evict the veterans. Soldiers on foot and horseback pushed into the camp. Patton brought tanks into the streets as well. At first, the protesters didn't realize they were being attacked. They thought that maybe the military was marching to honor them. But then tear gas was shot into their midst. Soldiers also used another gas on the protesters called Atomsite, which induces vomiting. The veterans suffered from this attack, as did their wives and children. While their eyes were burning and they couldn't stop vomiting, the protesters and their families were forced out of their temporary settlements at the point of bayonets. The fleeing mass of humanity ran across the river to escape MacArthur and Patton. They traveled to another camp that was farther away. President Hoover sent another order to MacArthur telling him to stop the attack. Douglas MacArthur ignored the order and claimed that the Bonus Army was trying to overthrow the United States government. MacArthur and Patton pushed into the next camp and began firing on the protesters. Fifty-five veterans were injured. One hundred and thirty-five were arrested. One woman suffered a miscarriage and a baby died after being caught in a tear gas attack. Joe Angelo was one of the veterans who joined the Bonus Army. In 1918, he saved George Patton's life in France. He was given the Distinguished Service Cross for his heroism. He approached Patton after the violence ended. Patton was not interested in listening to the man who saved his life. He said, I do not know this man. Take him away, and under no circumstances permit him to return. Delayed Victory Dwight D. Eisenhower would one day be the supreme commander of Allied forces in World War II. He would also become president, but in 1932 he was MacArthur's aide. He was not impressed with how the Bonus Army was treated. He said of MacArthur, I told that dumb son of a bitch not to go down there. Although MacArthur had disobeyed direct orders, it was President Hoover who suffered the consequences. Hoover lost his bid for re-election, and in 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt became President of the United States. While campaigning, Roosevelt didn't support the Bonus Army, but he also didn't plan to make the same mistakes as Hoover. When veterans again marched to Washington, D.C. in 1933, Roosevelt had a camp set up for them. The military provided three meals a day, and they even had free entertainment. Roosevelt did not give the former soldiers what they demanded, but he did offer them jobs in what were called veteran rehabilitation camps. It wasn't what the veterans wanted, but it was better than nothing. General MacArthur would 
have a notable military career that lasted until 1951. During the Korean War, he was forced to retreat, and it looked like the conflict may be lost entirely. Harry Truman was president and wanted to make sure that a war wasn't triggered with China. The Soviet Union and China had signed a defense pact, so the threat of nuclear war could not be dismissed. MacArthur ignored President Truman's directives. It was also discovered that he was communicating with foreign governments directly and contradicting Truman when he did so. In April 1951, MacArthur was fired. President Truman later said, I fired him because he wouldn't respect the authority of the president. I didn't fire him because he was a dumb son of a bitch, although he was, but that's not against the law for generals. If it was, half to three quarters of them would be in jail. George S. Patton would command troops during World War II, but at the end of the war he was involved in an accident. Patton's car collided with an army truck. He hit his head on the windshield and became paralyzed. Twelve days later, he died in the hospital. Although the bonus army participants would not receive additional compensation, the next generation of soldiers would. Congress passed the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, which ensured that those who served in the military received a number of benefits. They were given unemployment pay, access to loans, and tuition for further education. Unlike the veterans from World War I, many of those who served in the Second World War prospered once their service ended. What do you think about the way the bonus army was treated? Was it a bad idea to bring their families to a protest? And should Douglas MacArthur share most of the blame? Are veterans treated better today? Tell us what you think in the comments below. If you want to make sure we keep incrementally destroying your faith in humanity, then please like this video and subscribe to our channel. We also have a Patreon page and merchandise, just like all the other YouTube beggars. We're not better than them, but at least we're honest. Look for links in the video description if you're interested. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.